Hello friends, welcome to Trending. Today is Thursday, January 26th. We're recording a little after 9.30. Good morning, Joe. Morning, how's it going? Good. What you got you in that today? cup, man? This is what you have uh, affectionately named the Airsman yes. from Quick Trip, the Diet Dew with a little shot of vanilla. Yeah, it is. Great, the best way to start the morning. All right, man. <laughs> so, Powered up. This is the Airsman. This is not the Airsman. Mmm, so, that's delicious. This is the pink sauce. We have been talking about pink sauce for months at that's this right. point. That's right. Some of you have been asking us, asking us about it. After the whole thing with the FDA, the whole TikTok thing, that we talked about it months ago. I don't even know when, how long ago this has been. But it's fine. I guess it's cleared whatever clearance it needed to go through. Now you can buy this at our local Walmart in Wichita. Where did you find it? I found it at Walmart, the east side location near our house. And uh, But it's in the condiment aisle. So if you're l- trying to track it down and... Do not be confused with a bottle of stuff called the Pink Stuff. Okay. So it seems like somebody pretty bright is ripping it I off. Don't, I don't blame them, but they're kind of like uh, drafting off the energy of the Pink Sauce. They're riding the so, wave. So there's a difference between like Pink Sauce and the Pink Stuff. Okay. So you are very kind. You bought me a bottle. You have a bottle. That's right. So this week we have both had this at our homes. And I think we were kind of maybe originally going to try a couple of things like live this morning. But we decided let's try it on a bunch of things at home. That's right. So we both took it home. Um, I had my family try it. Nice. And um, I'll show you a couple of video clips here in a minute. One mm. member of my family loved it. Um, what did, What was your did – you, did your family – did your kids and Ginger try it? Uh, so the kids tried it. They enjoyed it. But, like, I think we're pretty easy going with condiments. We're the ones who get the extra – as many extra Chick-fil-A packets and Freddy's sauces that we can. Of course. And Ezra puts it on everything. So I do this thing called condiment roulette. Have I talked about this before? Um, I don't know. Do you know this about me? I mean, I'm not too surprised, but go yeah. ahead. So we got, like, like anybody else, like, you know, one of the doors in our refrigerator's got condiments. And sometimes what I'll do is just close my eyes and I'll just, like, reach out and grab two things. And I just roll with it. And it's usually fine. Like, I, I never really grossed out by condiment using. So you know, I was going to like the pink sauce no matter what. I think okay. because of all the, the expectation. But I think it's actually pretty tasty. So I tried it on an Arby's curly fry. It was great. Okay. Like random leftovers. It was great. Um, I tried it on some salmon patties. So I got this kind of air fry, some salmon patties, Mm -hmm. dumped it on there. It was great. Like anything, I feel like it's going to be good on about anything. Okay. So that's my conclusion. All right. There you go. So how about you? I I, I didn't, I did not love it. I'm not quite as much of a sauce condiment fanatic as you are. Okay. So I don't have, uh, maybe, maybe your palate is just more refined than mine. I'm just bland. Like I've broken mine down. It's not (laughs) refined at all anymore. (laughs) Everything tastes the same. (laughs) Pink mush. Yeah. (laughs) So we'll, we'll take a, we'll uh, take a break. I'll show you somebody here in just a second. But first, here's, I have a theory though. Okay. Here's my theory. Lay it on me. Because I, I didn't love it, okay. right? That's fine. And I will say the mystery, kind of one of the reasons why it blew up online is it's really hard to describe, right? That's yeah. part of the, the allure was people who tried it couldn't really describe what it tasted like. I, that's kind of true. Like, I, I don't really know how to describe what it tastes like. Right. But how, I guess dragon fruit is the first ingredient. So we had it at staff meeting. We had a big, long staff meeting on uh, Monday. And that's when I gave it to you. Yeah. And we got some footage of you trying it for the first time. But, like, everybody else at the table... When you mentioned dragon fruit, they had no idea what it was. I, yeah. I saw it on at least two people's screens. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some what, Google image what is of dragon, dragon fruit? fruit. You know, it's so like <laughs> I don't know. It's good for us to expand our minds here in the Midwest. Yes, <laughs> and so that's what dragon fruit is. I guess it's in it. So here's my wild hypothesis. Okay, right, my 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 suspicion is that possibly the original pink sauce before it went through the FDA mm-hmm. was different than what we're getting from our local. Oh, 100 percent. So I wonder. If I would have enjoyed the original more than I enjoyed, because the original it looked like thick and saucy, and this is kind of what you like a normal consistency for like a condiment, right? Yeah. So I kind of wish we could get our hands on the original, because I don't love this, but I'm curious what the original tastes. How close is this to the original? But okay, should we go ahead and roll it? Do you have any, anything else you want to say about this, or should we roll some clips of us trying this? All, so okay, you're gonna have. There's a little bit of sticker shock because it is like twice as much as any other condiment out there. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're gonna get some, just know that you might have to like skip a meal to yeah. cover the cost because it was. I was like, wow, because I think it's so rare. There's so much energy around it. They are, yeah. you know, capitalism wins again. Uh, they're capitalizing on that. So yes. anyways, it was a good time. Okay. Well, let's real quick show a couple highlights of us and our families trying pink sauce. Nice.
Yeah. See, what is it? Uh, I would prefer Chick fil A sauce. Yeah. Yep. Do you like it? Is it yummy? <laughs> Not good with lasagna. <laughs> you like the pink sauce? Just eating it. Sure. <laughs> so it's spicy? A little bit. Gross. <laughs> Is it yummy? <laughs> Watch this. I like it. More, <laughs> like it. No more dip. Okay, so that, it was fun. It was a good experiment. I'm really glad we tried. Thank you for your kindness and buying the very expensive uh, bottle of pink sauce. It's the least I can do, Matthew. It's the very <laughs> least I could do. I got my pink sweater on for pink sauce day. Oh. It's just you know. Opportunity missed on my part. If, I'm sorry. Yes. If so, if you want to try it, it's it's at Walmart. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you happen to be around the church office, I think I might just leave mine here. Yeah. So if, if you happen to be around the church office sometime, maybe find one of us. We can hook you up. And John and Millie Shaw, they went and got the day that training went out, and yes. they sent me pictures and stuff. So kudos for them for launching out and trying it too. Yes. And if you try it, let us know. Shoot us a comment or find us at church. We'd love to hear what you think of pink sauce. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. I do have one actual like real topic to talk about today. Right, so let's get well. to our no our normal again our, our evolving normal uh, trending shtick here. So <laughs> what a term! Yeah. Lots lots of things going on in the world in the news this week. One thing that I thought was interesting. So um, I'm guessing you're familiar with the, the Doomsday Clock. Yes. Okay. So I read a little bit about it because yesterday the news broke. So every January. There's a group from the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Hmm. It's this group of very smart scientists who every January, they look at what's going on in the world and they try to kind of hypothesize if we could guess when the end of the world is, how close are we to the end of the world? So if you imagine a clock, uh, the closer you get to midnight, the closer you are to Armageddon, the end of the world, right? And so it's a little skewed because they are um, scientists who are studying specifically um, technology and like nuclear stuff. So they're kind of keeping, those are the things that they're mostly keeping an eye on. A little bit of like climate change is in their scope as well. Um, so they're looking at very specific things, right? Okay. Yeah. But the news this week was that it, they moved to 90 seconds to midnight. Right. So they these scientists think that we're getting closer and closer to the end of the world based on technology and nuclear stuff. I really, just in case you're curious, um, this whole clock thing started in 1947. So the original timeline was it was seven minutes to midnight in 1947. That's like a World War II era, like, you know, just after World War II era. Yes. Like, yes yeah. And so I guess, like, a couple a couple minutes into it would have been, like, the beginning of human history. So we're, they're saying from the beginning of human history to now, seven minutes to midnight. Since then, it's gone backward eight times and forward 17 times. Wow. So it's moved back and forth a lot over the years. And the, clo the farthest away from midnight was 17 minutes away in 1991. And the nearest is right now in 90 seconds. My goodness. So, okay, that's a little bit of just the framework. That's what was in the news this week. So what I wanted to hear you talk about, Joe, I think Christians like to talk about the end of the world. Mm -hmm. I think we have this fascination with the book of Revelation, uh, with heaven, and we just have this fascination of what is the end of the world going to look like? What is our place in that? When is it going to happen? Um, so we like to talk about that. So with the doomsday clock in mind, I'm just, I want to hear your thoughts. Do you think it's good for us to be really interested in that? Mm -hmm. Is there some downside to that? Should we be like actively trying to figure out the signs and revelation to figure out how close we are? Does it, should that affect our day-to-day -day, day life or maybe not? How do you view end of the world and how should that affect our day-to-day -day life? Well, wow. well, first thing I'd say is if you actually watch the clip of the Doomsday Clock reveal, <laughs> It was like anticlimactic. Like they, they told the time left and they sat there still and quiet. And it was awkward. I think, like, so maybe scientists don't make great television. Is that's, that what you're that's right. And I think Kimmel tried to like spruce it up a little bit. I was watching it. It was funny. Okay. So, but I think, um, I think the end of the world stuff. So obviously the Bible does have some sort of um, an awareness of that we're moving towards something. Um, and I think that uh, Judaism and Christianity, which sprung from Judaism, 
had a different view than the Greco-Roman view, which is the palingenensia. Um, you've probably heard that one before. Of course, no, I talk yeah, about yeah. it every day. Yeah. <laughs> but the palingenensia is like a, like a reboot of something. So like, you know when you're losing in a video game mm-hmm. and you want it to all go away, Yeah. you can just hit the reset button. Yes. And like all of a sudden, like the title slide comes back on. It's like it never happened. You get to start over again. Or you're about to lose a game of Madden and you've got a perfect record. So you end the game saying, so none of us ever do that. That's right. right. So, okay, go so, ahead. So palingenensia, it was like that idea where there's going to be like a, a reboot. Mm-hmm. So it's not going like to a final end and a climax and, and like a consequence of things that have happened before. It's like, no, it's all going to start over. Mm-hmm. And uh, because there probably wasn't a better word, I think one of the gospel writers puts this word in Jesus' mouth, but he doesn't have that sense. And Christianity doesn't have like a reincarnation, micro uh, reincarnation for like for us as human beings. Like it's, it's all heading towards somewhere. Yeah. Um, I think... What we could say is like the, the biblical idea is that God is trying to, like he created a world that he loved. It's his world. And uh, something has gone down within it. But instead of like allowing it to unravel, God put on human form in Jesus and wants to redeem it from its mess. And it's heading a direction. And it's not heading like backwards towards the garden, yeah. but it's actually heading towards like a heavily, densely populated city. Uh, similarities are that God's in the middle with his people in the midst mm-hmm. of it, yeah. but it's heading actually towards a different direction. And it's going to be praiseworthy, but um, the biblical voice is has this like sober reality of we're going to go through some hardships, mm-hmm. uh, some, some trim, trembles. Uh, the Bible says that, that once more the heavens and the earth are going to be shaken. Um, the book of Revelation talks about like a new heaven and a new earth. So mm-hmm. like even what heaven is currently like now is going to be made new into something else. And so in that sense, there is like this looming category of this is all heading somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's not heading backwards. Mm -hmm. Um, And there is going to be significant challenges between here and there. Um, The New Testament um, talked about how these are the last days. And Mm -hmm. so New Testament letters and writings are in the first century. So like if those are the last days, then Mm -hmm. like are we in the last hours or even 90 seconds, you know, now. And so I think this is always going to be an evergreen category. But like your greater question is, is what, how much should that occupy our minds today? Yeah. And I think um, our particular brand of Christianity, mm-hmm. we call it this broadly evangelicalism, um, is activistic in one of our core tenets. So uh, Bebbington's got a quadrilateral of evangelicalism. And one of those things is activism. We want to see the world change around us. Um, I think uh, evangelicalism changed after the world wars hmm. and like the threat of nuclear uh, war to where there's more an, an aggressiveness to try to go to every nation, to every people group. Because Jesus said once the whole, all, every nation, every people group hears the gospel, then the end will come. Hmm. And so like there's this sense where we're racing against maybe the threat of uh, global catastrophe uh, many different people groups have still have yet to hear the gospel intelligibly in their own language. Yep. And so we're working tirelessly. I think also we tend to use the looming threat of the end of the world as a way for people to not just think about their day-to-day life, but like ultimately eternal things. Yeah, destiny. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's used again and again, right? And so like they have these judgment houses, you know, where like individuals think about like their own life, how you and I could drive home to, yeah. you know, from work today and something could happen to us. What would your life like amount to if that happened mm-hmm. today, right? Yeah. Um, and then like think about all these different world events, like big things that are happening, and like there's a, seems to be escalation in Ukraine and Russia, um, and stuff that's happening in other part, hot spots in the world. And so we need to think, well, maybe this is maybe this is going to be the season. Mm-hmm. But it's it, it's just interesting. Maybe we can call it embarrassing that if we actually look back the last 30, 40, 50 years of evangelicalism. Like people have been like predicting like the imminent end of the world, and it hasn't happened. Yeah. So what do we do there? Like, do we mm-hmm. call these people false prophets? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to because I don't want to be mean. Like, mm-hmm. I, uh, I think they're trying to do their best to, like, you know, to let people know that they need to, like, get their life in order. And so I think that we have to probably um, have that sprinkled within our preaching and teaching, mm-hmm. within our spirituality. Yeah. Um, but my th- maybe it's just my personality. I'd rather, la- like, that's above my pay grade. Mm-hmm. So I, I think I'm going to deal with, like, the day-to-day and uh, just try to make the most of it today. And then, um, yeah, let, th- let all that stuff be uh, in God's hands, in God's uh, desires and dreams and plans. And I- I'm just going to do the day-to-day because I think when I um, get too focused on it, 
like I really do kind of miss the stuff I think is probably most important. Yeah. And in general, like this is not scientific, but in general, the Bible has more to say about our lived experience today and what happens in the afterlife. And I think it has more to talk about what's, what you and I are responsible for today mm-hmm. than what's ultimately going to happen in catastrophe or at the end of the age. Um, I think it was Martin Luther, maybe Martin Luther King, one of the, Mar- one of the Martin Luthers out there <laughs> okay. who said, if I, if I knew the world was going to end tomorrow, I would still plant a tree today. Mm-hmm. I think that's like the perspective that I've, imbi- uh, that I've embraced. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Mm-hmm. It's, it's probably gonna, my hunch is going to be a whole lot like today, and so I'm going to go ahead and like put my chips behind that wager, yeah. and figure out like what can I do within my power today, mm-hmm. and leave that the other stuff, you know, for someone who can actually do something about it because I know I can't. Yeah, so, yeah, no, that's good. That's my two cents. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. I think um, I think there's a there's a benefit to living knowing that there is an end, right? Knowing that there is an end coming it gives you a little bit of urgency. Um, maybe it affects your day-to-day perspective a little bit. So I think yes. that is wise. But I'm with you. Like People way smarter than me. There might even be some people smarter than you, maybe. I don't know. There oh, aren't very many. But I'm just <laughs> 21 on the very, ACT, folks. <laughs> very <laughs> smart people spent their entire lives trying to decode the Bible, trying yeah. to figure out when end times are. And the Bible says that Jesus doesn't even know when the end times are going to come, right? Right. And so I guess I don't really get a whole lot of, I don't really understand the value of really trying to dial that stuff in to like, it's going to be this day or this day or this day. Cause I don't, we, we don't know, we're not going to figure it out. Right. But living with urgency can be good. Right. Yeah. So I think kind of that, um, knowing that our days are numbered is wise, right. but arguing and spending all your time studying details to try to piece together a narrative that none of us really know. Mm-hmm. I guess I don't really see the benefit of that. And then, and then getting cranky with others who may not share your urgency. Yeah, right. It's just not very um, profitable. It's, it's not. You can't uh, win people over to your side persuasively that way. Yeah. Um, a, a quotation, long quotation that uh, framed my dissertation uh, in the doctor ministry degree was by a guy named Robert Farrar Capon. He's got a book on the parables of Jesus, and he's talking about uh, one of the last parables in Matthew where Jesus talks about like the 10 virgins and their oil, like there are five wise and five unwise. Yeah. And it's a sobering parable. But in there, he's got this big long quote, and I'll put it up on the screen. But the gist of it is this, is that like God is not coming back to earth like our cranky mother-in-law to see if like the wedding china that she gave us is chipped. Mm-hmm. But he's a funny old uncle with like a bottle of wine under one arm and a salami under the other. And he's, he's coming to throw a party. And he says, and this party is not like far off, hmm. but it's like it's it's developing. It's in the basement, like working its way up our cellar stairs. Hmm. It's not some, like we're getting hints of what the new world is going to be. Mm-hmm. And even though there is going to be a reckoning of all things, individual lives, corporate lives, it's yeah. going to happen. The, the mm-hmm. scripture is clear about that. It's ultimately going to give way to a everlasting party. Mm-hmm. And um, what Capon says is. Um, you and I are going to look forward to this party. Like yeah. it would be, it would be devastating to miss it, mm-hmm. and not because of the party itself, but because of the central figure who's throwing and organizing this party. Yeah, That's that cool. should shape our spirituality more than mm-hmm. trying to re- read the tea leaves yeah. of what destruction could be coming down the road. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that's better for our, our personal spirituality, our corporate spirituality, totally. than, than like all these like finer details of what like how many seconds we are to midnight. Right. It's just not going to organize and mobilize human beings. What we've seen over time is what organizes us is opportunity and not looming threats. Mm-hmm. That might make us move a little bit in the short term, but yeah. in the long term, delight inspires us more than doomsday. Mm. That's good. Yeah. So we need a delight clock instead of a doomsday clock. We, we should come up with it. And it should always be 6 o'clock. The delight clock is always 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock somewhere. It's always, <laughs> there's, al- there's always delight bef- before and ahead of you. That's right. Let's do that delight clock, 6 let's, o'clock. Let's do it, man. If we made that, but, who knows? Like tens of people might really like, follow that. And, like, <laughs> I will say, the, the dawn of pink sauce might lead us one second closer to doomsday. <laughs> the fact that this is at Walmart <laughs> is a little concerning to me. So right. Maybe we are getting closer. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> Okay, anything else to close out today, Joe? No, nah, man. Uh, so we, we'll continue on uh, in the Psalm series this weekend. It's actually uh, Big Church Sunday yeah. where 
Uh, children's programming outside of nursery is canceled so that we can all be together as one big family for worship. All I can say is there's going to be a pretty neat sermon illustration that you're not going to want to miss. Yes. I, I don't want to say anything else because we don't want to let the tiger out of the cage. Yes. That, I know what you're talking about, and that will be fun. And this week I've been working on a video. I've had a bunch of kids and students come oh, nice. to give a tour of the building. So you're going to see a video tour of the new construction led by kids and students. I think it'll be cool, too. So And, like, the, the question is going to be, like, what is the over-under that a kid with a mullet is going to be in that video? Maybe 20% chance? I, I won't spoil it for you. How about All right. that? All right. I'm going to take the over on that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, we hope to see you Sunday. We'd love to have you all, all ages in the Worship Center for Big Church Sunday, except for nursery. The nursery's open, which sure. is a good thing. Yeah. So have a great Thursday, great weekend. We hope to see you on Sunday. We'll see you next time. See ya. Sadie, do you like the dip? Thank you. <laughs> you have more dip?